We have um, 20 minutes, 20 minutes for questions to either speaker. And uh, the floor is open. Yeah. Uh, Sam, do you have a question for Hunter? I, I tenuously see us in uh, the neutrality trap uh, set by the uh, industry of doubt, which says that any view is equal to any other. Uh, and I think it's critical that the university not allow that to happen, and that even though their <coughs> scholarship may point very clearly in one direction, <laughs> and that gets them attacked politically, I think protecting that, uh, that non-neutrality based on fact is a critical responsibility of the university. So Sam, could you just elaborate a little bit on what, what you mean by non-neutrality there and give maybe an example? Well, um, every time I uh, present something uh, and uh, I have a set of uh, facts to present, uh, when it's reported in the press, it will say, he said this, but of course, X said the opposite. Right. Uh, now X may have no basis for their position. Uh, and I remember this very vividly during the AIDS epidemic uh, when we were trying to get some uh, for something going uh, in terms of support of the investigation uh, that would lead us somewhere in that case. But it's that sense that the press feels that it has to present two things as equal, yeah. and who can protect the people who are saying something that is still fact-based. Right. That, that's a really good point, and I agree with you entirely. This is something the press now sees as its obligation in order to remain objective, as though reporting two sides of something where one side has all the facts and data and the other side has none is, is an objective way to behave. I, I couldn't agree with you more and I don't think that that's the kind of neutrality I mean to represent because what we provide is in fact expertise. That is the university's uh, advantage it seems to me. That's what we're also respected for. All right. Yes, um, this is a wonderful conference, uh, having such great fun and taking so many notes. I was wondering if we could broaden the question about technology transfer to all universities. Um, it's my impression, but I'm sure you have the facts better than I do, that the, this fundamental change in the commercialization of university research has yielded very little net of financial gain for most universities. And so might it be a policy where there are 5% winners and 95% losers, while uh, the desperate effort to try to make some money at 95% of the universities has distorting effects? And I was wondering if the two of you could discuss that question. I'm going to let one of the winners speak <laughs> first. <laughs> It's, it, you're correct, and um, there's an organization, Autumn, the Association of University Technology Managers that um, publishes reports every year and we encourage people who want to find out more to, to go look at those. Uh, but um, I, I, I think the, the, the issue of winners and losers is not so much uh, something decided by external forces, it's more how much attention each you know university has paid to this, and our in our case there happens to have been quite a bit. Um, many other universities are either um, revenue neutral or more typically actually losing money on their technology licensing activities. Now, as I said um, in answer to a, a question, we actually lose money on everything we do, for the most part. And I think even if we were to do a, a proper accounting of how much it costs us to do the research that was commercialized, it still might not make money. But we think it's an important thing to do, just like other parts of our, um, uh, of our mission. So uh, looking at the revenues is, is uh, I think, not the appropriate uh, thing to do. There have been other st studies that have actually looked more at the uh, amount of economic activity that was generated, most of which does not cause revenue to flow back to the universities, but does uh, affect um, uh, the economy. And those uh, measures have actually been quite positive, and then particularly one, I think, that looked at NIH research. Maybe, uh, I don't know if Sally Rocky might mention that later, 
um, uh, I think it was a Milken uh, study. Um, may I turn to Don and then? Uh, the, uh, the, the, the story really started with a joint effort between a public and a private institution, not because Bayh-Dole had just happened, because it hadn't yet. It was done on a waiver by NIH. And uh, since some people have pointed to the sad state of publicly supported state institutions in these budgetary days, it's worth pointing out that it was shared in, in that way and benefited the two institutions equally. Uh, Derek? Do you have a question? Well, I just want to say, I agree with the point that you make but when they did one. The only survey I know of technology transfer officers, when they asked, what is the most important objective of your office, the overwhelming majority, something like 80% said, uh, maximizing revenue. So I think you're swimming upstream, and I, I congratulate you for doing it. But uh, the current the other way is very strong. Well, I, I, I do think Claude stated it exactly correctly, however, and um, it may be that that survey did produce that result. But I remember hearing the, um, the woman in charge of uh, tech transfer at Stanford give a talk a few months back, and she specifically, strongly said that is not why we do this at Stanford. And if it were, we'd be pretty bad failures at it many, many years. So I, I do think and hope that that is beginning to spread a little more widely, because I think Claude's got it exactly right. Question for Hunter. Uh, uh, re regarding your second value, neutrality, which I heard you define more or less as um, uh, uh, not pursuing a political agenda, it seems to me there's a chasm between the elite universities, and I'm talking about even just the top 10 or even a subset of them, in their approach to that value. And surprisingly, it's the elite universities like Harvard that are much more amenable to having their faculty be involved in the political process, write op-eds, take positions, and are rewarded. And you go just drop below that, and they have this incredible fear of being viewed in any way as par a partisan or ad advocate. Now, just to give you an example, my wife leads a national movement for starting school later K to 12 education, and she's gone to a bunch of prominent sleep researchers who have no problem endorsing products to sell to adolescents to sleep later, but they don't want to be, they say, oh, we support your cause, but we don't want to be per perceived as supporting an advocacy organization where she doesn't have problems going to, you know, really senior scholars. And, and so do you agree with that perception? And do you think it may be I think there are good institutional incentives why the Harvards tend to reward this type of public behavior and the second tier institutions are fearful of it. But do you think this, you agree with the observation? And do you think it's maybe damaging that scholars are so fearful of pursuing, even if they believe it, uh, advocacy positions in public because they'll feel they're damaged their, their institutions? I don't know if that chasm you mentioned um, actually exists. It's an interesting uh, thesis that it does. I do think faculty members are well advised to take the stance that you outlined. Um, there's nothing wrong with a faculty member giving a strong opinion on something as long as she makes it quite clear this is not the university's position, it's not the college's position, it's her position. And in fact, I hope our faculty will take such stances more sometimes than they ordinarily do. But I, that does speak to the fact that evidently a lot of faculty members do feel cautious about this, and it's probably wise to be at least cautious about it. But I, but I don't believe they need to avoid taking positions themselves, as long as they're clear. But could I just ask, do you think that faculty person would be asked for her opinion if she weren't a professor at Cornell? I mean, you know, the fact is that and I think this is true of the whole, one of the big problems that we face is that whether universities insist that one day a week consulting is purely free time and has no in university involvement, 
the fact is that the persons who are getting these assignments never get rid of their prof professorial titles. I mean, when they go in consulting, they don't leave them in a drawer. They're asked because of their acclaim. And so it, it's a sort of self-delusion to think that, that I'm going to be asked you know, to comment out in California about some health issue because I'm such a great guy. It was because I was dean of a medical school. And there's no question that that was the reason I was asked. So I think there's a problem in our conception of consulting, uh, whether I write an op-ed and say this is my opinion and not Stanford University's opinion or Harvard's opinion. I'm asked because of my link to the university. And I, I think it's either good or it's unfortunate. You never get it off. Till you're fired or something like that, but you just don't get rough. Um, there we go. Thank you. Um, I love your talk, uh, Hunter, and I'm very sympathetic to uh, your point of view, but I can imagine several um, reactions and then questions. One is that I can hear them saying, well, here's, well, maybe not a Luddite, but a Platonist, which would be even worse, um, and it doesn't have any idea, has, 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 has no idea about where progress is going and what's, what, what is happening by way of change. But if I agree with you, as, as I think I really do in terms of your three uh, principles, uh, the University of Chicago in its famous Calvin report, I think almost basically institutionalizes the idea that the university shall not take any political or social position as such. It's been criticized for that, but its presidents have held to that. With all the pressures that exist that counter your image of the university and where it should be, how are the presidents able, what mechanisms exist or could exist to, to as it were, push back or to, to move in that direction when so many of the pressures, political and social pressures um, are countering that, are going in just the other direction? Well, I mean, that's a fair question. And here it seems to me, um, once again, we see the value in this country of not having a system of higher education. A couple of times earlier today, speakers have talked about our system of higher education. We don't have one in this country. Other countries do. But I think one of the great glories of, of this country's universities is that we're not a system. We have public, we have private, we have small, we have church supported and sponsored, and we have purely secular, et cetera, et cetera. So I would say, John, that there is a, Jonathan, that there is a difference here. Um, I do think private universities can stay clearer of some of these conflicts than public universities. They, they just can by virtue of being private. And I remember well when uh, I was interviewing for the job at uh, the University of Iowa and I met with the, the Board of Regents and had dinner with them and we were ordering uh, dinner in a Des Moines uh, restaurant and it came around to me and I looked at the menu and I said to this farmer on the board sitting next to me, I guess I'd better order the meat, right? And he said, if you want the job. <laughs> and I thought, Okay, I, I figured that one out. Well, th that, that sort of demonstrates that, you know, I was, I was sitting in Iowa, and, and if I was going to represent the University of Iowa, there were certain pretty clear obligations. Well, you don't have to worry about that at, uh, at Harvard. You can order the fish. Um, and, and so I, I do think there are grades of this. This can happen in cases of affirmative action, clearly. It also happens in cases of extending full and equal recognition <coughs> to uh, gay and lesbian partners um, and 
uh, health care to transsexual students and staff and so on and on. Um, at my university, University of Minnesota, the faculty senate, not the administration, but the faculty senate, took a position against a voter restriction constitu state constitutional mm -hmm. amendment on the grounds that it's part of our interest to have an educated and fully participating citizenry and so on. So it seems to me that there are a number of cases where core university values turn out actually to be politically controversial. <coughs> Well, there certainly are, and um, there are many, many such uh, instances that we all know of. I, I myself would prefer that we err on the side of, of caution with, in such cases. I don't mean that we don't occasionally have the right or maybe even the duty to take such a position, but I think we ought to be really careful to, to minimize those, because it seems to me we're giving a university vote to something, or a faculty vote to something where we may have many voices and points of view in the faculty and in the university, and I, I don't think it's right to speak for others in our community. So I, I worry about that, perhaps more than I should, but I, I, I just don't think it's appropriate in, in most instances to take a position. Internal policies of equality for gay and lesbian partners? That's, that's different. But, but I thought you were outlining a, a public profession in, a, in an election or in some sort of a ballot. Maybe I mistook what you were suggesting. Uh, can, I, can I pose a hypothetical? I'd sort of be interested, not, not so much in a quick answer, but let it linger. So um, I'm the president of a major research university. I have a school of a very acclaimed school of earth sciences or geology or whatever. And I'm also in a state that has a rich potential fracking opportunity, uh, which is controversial politically uh, in the state for the re reasons that the such things are. And I'm approached by a um, trustee or a major donor out of the blue who offers the university, you know, $40 million of money for something we really want, or even more rare, unrestricted for, you know, for the president's to use, with a promise of more to come. And, you know, you do your research and you know that that individual is probably worth a couple billion dollars. So more to come is real. I mean, it's not really hypothetical. So how would that, and this person is in an industry that's a leader in fracking. So how would that gift come into the university and how would it not affect the research agenda of the Earth Sciences School, which has some world experts that are relevant to fracking and its effect on all kinds of things. I mean, what do you do in a case like that? I mean, this is a big box, I mean, really big box. And yet it's on a direct issue that's controversial, very controversial, where you have faculty who could make major scientific contributions to the science of fracking. It's good and it's bad. And you've got a big gift from a person with lots of money who is a you know, the chairman of a company, an international multi-billion dollar company that is leading the fracking drive. Now, I, I mean, I see that as riddled with difficult, conflictual problems. But I'm wondering, and you, you know, you don't have to answer it right now because only a couple of minutes, but just how would you do it? <laughs> I guess I'd only like to note that President Bach wrote an article on pretty much exactly that question, not so much for fracking, but on the issue of Harvard accepting <coughs> gifts. Yeah, I, I think that must have been 20 or 30 years ago, uh, which I happen to have read recently, that it was talking exactly about that dilemma. And I th as I recall, the, the, the conclusion, I mean, you should speak to it, please, not, not me putting words in your mouth, but that it was... 
But uh, it's, uh, you know, it came down ag again to the issue of uh, it depends. And uh, I think uh, Larry was saying this earlier that, that in some sense we make these decisions every day in one way or another. Some of them are more controversial than others, but um, the easy ones get made quickly and it's the other ones that take all the time. So I think that that university president will have a very um, many sleepless nights trying to come up exactly that, uh, that the answer to that question. Well, that perhaps we could come back to that during the rapporteur se session when there's a lot of time for conversation. And let's thank our two speakers. <laughs> Thanks so much.